So now it is my great pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker, Professor Shang Jingwei, the world's leading expert on Chinese economy and many other fields, professor at Columbia University and former chief economist of Asian Development Bank. Shang Jing, welcome back, as we already saw him from the video, second time back. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maggie Chin. Uh, good morning, uh, friends and colleagues. It's a great uh, uh, privilege and pleasure uh, to be invited back to uh, uh, George Washington University for this uh, uh, conference. I was embarrassed to see myself uh, here was six, seven years ago. My views stay the same, but I'm just substantially older. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, the Chinese Party Congress is going to take place in a few uh, weeks. Tremendous importance event for uh, China. The only thing that's as important as that in Washington DC this week uh, is this conference. I look forward to hearing from uh, uh, insights from many of you. I want to uh, share with you some, some thought about uh, uh, US-China trade, in particular the impact of US-China trade on uh, uh, US employment. Uh, I, I know many people in the room are at least as knowledgeable uh, as, uh, as me, and so please feel free to interrupt and, and share your view. Uh, I look forward to our discussion on this uh, topic. Now, this, uh, much of my talk is going to be based on uh, uh, recent research uh, with three other, uh, a team of co-authors, uh, Zhi Wang, Xing Dingyu, uh, and uh, Kun Fu Zhu. President uh, Trump, uh, as, many of you know, as many of you know, have been a major boost to economic and social science research, including <laughs> on uh, trade topics. And you know, uh, during the campaign, he has made you know, uh, many comments uh, 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 somewhat negative and derogative comments on the impact of trade on U.S. economy, especially on, on uh, uh, U.S. workers, uh, job losses, income loss, and so on and so forth. And China is, was one of the countries he singled out, or the only one. He, he also managed to attack Mexico, Canada, and, and so on. But China certainly was uh, a major uh, uh, target. Uh, and here, here's one of the many possible quotes one can have uh, on uh, his view about the China trade. China is robbing us blind in trade deficits, uh, st st stealing our jobs, uh, and, and so on. But this, is, this particular view that trading with China uh, might have some uh, negative impact on US labor market uh, is not unique to President Trump. And you can find uh, 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 now uh, statements from very uh, established economist in very prestigious uh, journals. So, so here's one um, highly cited example, uh, a paper by uh, Arthur Dong Hansen, a three very distinguished economists in American Economic Review, a top uh, economics, uh, one of the top economics journals uh, uh, here. Uh, they analyze the impact of US trading with China on local US labor markets. Uh, and conclude that rising imports, they mean rising imports from China, cause higher unemployment, lower labor force participation rate, import competition, uh, and they collectively explain a sizable, a quarter of the de decline in US manufacturing jobs. Uh, other uh, equally distinguished economists in good journals also appear to have found uh, similar results. So I, here I also list the paper by Pierce and Short in AER. Uh, last uh, year. I, I want to, in uh, uh, my uh, 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 time slot, I want to suggest that their view and their analysis uh, may not be quite right, or at least not quite uh, 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 comprehensively done. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in particular, one of the missing piece, uh, pieces uh, is to look at the trade issue from a supply chain perspective, because uh, nowadays we are living in a world uh, uh, where economies are truly interconnected. I'm going to make precise what I mean by interconnection in this context and realizing interconnection aspect of uh, uh, economic relationship uh, across countries might lead to revision of the view. Indeed, I'm going to uh, provide some evidence that the view that US trading with China uh, uh, produces a massive net loss of jobs uh, is not quite right. Now, um, let me you know, uh, uh, review for you, you know, how I, would, how I uh, uh, got to that uh, point, thinking that perhaps that view is not, uh, is not that right. 
Well, first I know, I mean, I, I, I've been teaching a open economy macroeconomic classes, uh, uh, class uh, for many years. I knew the following fact, which I always tell my students, which is that if you look at aggregate US data, US unemployment rate and US trade deficit usually go in the opposite direction. That is, US tends to import a lot or run a larger deficit in times when US labor market is strong, when one does not need to worry about unemployment very much. Conversely, when US tend to import relatively less as a share of GDP, or run a smaller trade deficit in times when unemployment is high. So we, these two things, in fact, uh, uh, generally go in the opposite direction. So here's a uh, time series evidence on this. So on the, on the graph on the left, I plot time series for two variables uh, from 1960 to now. The uh, solid uh, line is the US unemployment rate. So it goes up and down, up and down some years. But you know, generally, there's no secular trend. That's why all the central banks believe in the notion of um, um, the, the natural rate of un unemployment. So the notion of natural rate of unemployment suggests unemployment is, such, is a variable that has no medium term or long term trend, ups and downs. The, uh, the broken line uh, is US uh, uh, overall trade deficit with the rest of the world as a share of GDP. So also ups and downs, ups and downs. But they tend to be low when unemployment is high and tend to be high when unemployment is relatively uh, low. The two go in opposite directions. The, the graph on the right um, is meant to present the same information in a clearer way uh, because uh, uh, so in, in particular, instead of scaling trade deficits by GDP, here I scale trade deficit by total trade, uh, US does in any given uh, year. So you take out the one trend, because US trade to GDP ratio rises over time, and you can see the negative association even more clearly. I knew this for a long time, uh, because I've been t telling this to the students. I verified this time and still true. Now, of course, this time, you know, since I was thinking about the impact of US-China trade on US job market, I wanted to also check whether the statement that holds for US uh, overall trade uh, pattern holds for US bilateral trade with China or not. So I checked the data and find the answer uh, is uh, yes. So on this slide, I mean slide two, the graph on the left uh, shows you three variables. Um, the solid line with a triangle uh, is uh, U.S. bilateral trade deficit uh, with China as a share of U.S. GDP. So it has a sec the upward trend, but ups and downs around the trend. The broken line, because uh, uh, trading with China is a relatively recent phenomenon, so this time series starts from 1991 to now. The broken line is the U.S. Uh, unemployment rate, right, up and down. And then the, uh, th this line with the circle on it is uh, uh, participation, U.S. labor force participation rate corrected uh, unemployment, essentially. Um, generally speaking, you also see a negative association between the two. This, is, this can be seen even more clearly if uh, when we scale U.S. bilateral trade deficit with China by U.S. total trade with China. So the denominator now becomes exports plus imports with, with China. And you see the negative association between uh, job market situation and uh, trade relationship with China uh, more clearly. If you replace uh, trade deficit with US imports from China, you get the uh, same pattern. Another way to see this negative association more clearly is instead of looking at the time series, just, let's just look at the raw data of you know, deficit in a particular year relative to unemployment in a particular year, and that's this graph. So here I plotted US bilateral trade deficit scaled by total trade against US unemployment they go in the opposite direction. So US essentially only run large deficits with China at times when labor market is extremely strong, when unemployment is not and should not be a major concern, uh, and the uh, US runs a, a smaller deficit. In early days, US uh, ran surplus in times when uh, unemployment is high. So running a surplus or smaller deficit generally, generally corresponds to bad labor market situation. So that's sort of one uh, 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 factor I, I sort of knew and get confirmed in the data that made me wonder 
uh, whether the orthodox Hansen and the, what I would now label as a received wisdom is, is uh, correct or not. Second thing is, uh, is the value chain perspective. I know, so when people look at Chui, they, you know, they are, they, you know, they, they, they tend to, when Otto Don Hansen and other economists uh, that, that I cited, when they look at the US-China trade, they tend to uh, be focusing on the fact that uh, imports from China tend to compete with some US production. This perspective uh, is incomplete because a chunk of US imports from China are, inter are actually intermediate goods, parts and components. For example, uh, 15, 20 years ago, Detroit, the auto industry is one industry virtually every US president loves to talk about and, and, and offer protection from time to time. US auto industry is globally competitive, or it's global competitive position, uh, partly because US can use globally competitive parts and components. 15 or 20 years ago, the most important foreign supply of auto parts and components to US auto industry uh, were uh, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Today, the most important foreign supply of auto parts and components uh, is China. And it's not just auto parts and components. In fact, uh, you know, Chinese supply intermediate goods in general is very big. Computers, uh, laptops, smartphones, laptops uh, most people have in this room and smartphones most people have in, in, in this room with very high degree of confidence, I will guess, uh, they, will be con they will be part of the US imports from uh, from uh, uh, China. And those intermediate goods, of course, by very nature, enable US firms that use those things to stay competitive, to not just maintain, but potentially expand their employment, A. And B, firms that, so unlike direct competition channel, where essentially only manufacturing firms in, uh, import from China, uh, in manufacturing firms will compete with China directly. U.S. firms that use imported intermediate goods and benefit from that and expand production, production and, and, and employment go outside manufacturing sectors. They include manufacturing sectors, but also include service firms. Universities, for example, uh, state U.S. universities, of course, are you know, globally most competitive, an important export sector uh, for, uh, for U.S. Uh, part of the competitiveness derives from the ability to use globally sourced uh, you know, furniture, you know, computers, lab equipment, and so on. An important part of it uh, come from, uh, come from uh, 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 China. So I think that another potentially missing piece uh, 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 of the uh, existing analysis that I quoted uh, is not to look at the issue also from value chain perspective. And I'm going to suggest that uh, uh, looking at the the issue from a value chain perspective makes a huge difference. Now, it's, it's not just that, uh, you know, important part of US, uh, uh, US uh, imports from China are intermediate goods. That, that fraction, fraction of imports that are intermediate goods actually has been rising over time. In 2000, the year before China's accession to WTO, that fraction was slightly under a quarter. Today, it's getting very close to um, 50 50%. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, uh, intermediate goods, uh, and of course, the total growth in intermediate goods in dollar amount is far more than just doubling because uh, US uh, uh, total imports from China grows very, very fast. All right, so um, now I want to uh, note, I want to note that um, uh, bringing supply chain perspective to this topic does not automatically uh, give you the result that trade will have a smaller negative impact on labor, U.S. labor market, or trade will produce a positive impact. Why? Well, supply chain simply is just a more comprehensive way, to, comprehensive way to look at this issue. But it doesn't automatically say effect will be less negative or effect will be positive, because supply chain perspective will, will say we we'll need to, beyond competition effect, we need to at least look at the two additional channels. On the one hand, the one I just said, U.S. firms that use in imported intermediate goods may expand their production and employment. I already said it. But on the other hand, there's one more negative channel that get also gets introduced by the supply chain perspective. In particular, other U.S. firms that don't directly compete with China's imports, but if they supply output to those U.S. firms that compete with China directly, they could also be affected negatively if they uh, client firms shrink their production, they will translate it into smaller demand 
for uh, output and, and, and employment of U.S. firms uh, 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 that, that, that they are upstream uh, firms. So the upstream channel is one more negative channel. The downstream channel is a positive channel. So this means going from the straightforward uh, focusing on competition channel to a more comprehensive supply chain based perspective does not automatically say impact of trade on labor market is less negative. This is a conceptual note. I'm going to argue and show evidence, however, that data suggests the positive employment effect coming from the downstream channel is going to be large enough to offset, in fact, slightly more than offset the combined negative effects coming from the direct competition channel and the indirect upstream channel, so that the, 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 the total net effect of trading with China on US labor market is a small positive effect. That many things affect the US labor market performance, unemployment and wage, technology, institution, policy, who's in the White House and so on would affect the labor market performance. One way uh, uh, to understand what I'm going to, uh, uh, to interpret what I'm going to present you is that the combination of all the other factors outside trade will produce a net job loss. Trade, interestingly, uh, uh, the evidence seems to suggest, on balance, corrects that little bit. Uh, it doesn't really produce net, ne uh, negative uh, uh, employment. It slightly improves the labor market outcome than otherwise the case. That's what I'm going to argue uh, uh, later. All right, let me, uh, so, I'm going to focus much of my 30-some uh, minute discussion on the uh, effect of a trade on employment, but I will also uh, make some remarks about effect on real uh, wages. In particular, um, uh, in terms of effect on quantitative employment, I'm going to suggest that the first, uh, uh, you know, first one can confirm the part of the conventional wisdom, the new conventional wisdom, that the direct competition channel uh, means that trading with China produces a loss in manufacturing jobs. On the other hand, uh, if we adopt a more comprehensive supply chain-based perspective, we will also find that both downstream effect and upstream effect matters, and downstream effect in particular, uh, produces a positive employment expansion effect. That is, firms that use imported uh, China-made parts and components expand their production. And this employment expansion effect can take place in a wider, wider set of economy, especially uh, in uh, service, uh, uh, service uh, sector, so that the overall effect uh, is such that uh, the Otto Don Hansen kind of a conclusion uh, is overturned. In terms of wages, uh, uh, you know, I will, uh, we do find evidence uh, that uh, uh, education level or skill levels workers matter. Uh, in particular, uh, less educated workers, why they often get reabsorbed into the labor force. Uh, that's the thing we emphasize. But the unbalanced uh, experience a decline in real wages. More educated workers tend to see an increase in real, real wages after trading shock. This part, uh, uh, many people will agree and, f uh, and find such evidence even without using supply chain perspective. The thing supply chain perspective adds uh, is to show that, in fact, uh, the total wage bill nonetheless goes up as a result of uh, trading with China. Uh, that is, um, the distribution issue is not just between people who own capital, dividend capital income versus labor income. The labor income as a whole, in fact, goes up, benefits from globalization in general and trading with China in particular. So stopping trade will not help labor collectively. Uh, it's another uh, perspective that we're going to uh, suggest. All right. Let me pause for a second to see if there are questions or comments. Any? Okay. So now let me tell you uh, a bit more uh, detail. So here, so uh, I, I'm I, I trying to make the presentation not technical, but here's one slide with a one equation, the only slide with equation. Um, so so here's a way to f first. Uh, you know, let me summarize how Otto Don Hansen, Pierce Short, and related paper look at the issue. The way you when think about this is they look at the issue by comparing variations of variables across different parts of the US, uh, something called commuting zones, using US Census Bureau uh, terminology. 
So the entire United, United, United States labor market is divided into mutual, 722 mutually exclusive commuting zones. So Washington DC and all the places that the, the red, orange line, red line can reach, can you know, constitute one commuting zone. The entire country can be broken down into these you know, places where people live and can commute to work. It's one commuting zone. 722 commuting zones uh, in total. What the previous authors on, on my slides uh, do is this, right? So they, um, uh, uh, they look at changes in manufacturing employment in any given commuting zone from over a time period, same from the year China joined WTO, 2000, to 2007, the year before global financial crisis. During this period, what has happened to a change in manufacturing employment uh, in, in, in the early studies, they scaled that by, uh, by a labor force and linked that to that region's uh, change in direct exposure to China. So direct exposure, to, I can explain to you what that is uh, uh, later, but some measure of region level exposure to China, how that exposure to China, direct, through direct competition channel, changes from 2000 to 2007. If you find a negative coefficient, which they did, they conclude that, you know, what negative coefficient means is that regions that experience a relatively fast increase in growth of imports from China tend to uh, ex exhibit a relatively fast decline in manufacturing employment. And then they have a uh, uh, strategy, instrumental variable strategy to say this correlation reflects causality. That's essentially their story. And there's some other variables uh, of less importance uh, for this discussion. Uh, one way to think, uh, to, to, to explain what we do uh, is to look at this equation and say that's a misspecified or incompletely specified uh, uh, a way to look at the world. The supply chain perspectives will say, yes, you want to look at a direct competition effect, but you also want to look at downstream effect and upstream effect. Uh, and and, and uh, these two additional terms will give you a more complete picture. So now let me explain how, how uh, we construct uh, these three crucial measures. First, uh, uh, direct competition measure, which is essentially the same as, as this. The way one does this is, uh, is a two-stage process. Stage one, you, you, you construct direct competition effect at the industry level. So the entire United States, you know, using an input output, uh, you know, uh, uh, using an input output table or, or any industry classification measure, let's say there will be 100 sectors. For each sector, you, you, you know the increase, uh, 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 the growth rate of imports from China from 2000 to 2007. Therefore, you can rank all those sectors in terms of the relative rate of growth in imports. Right? Some sector will experience a lot of in growth imports, others will be less. Some sectors, like service sector, will experience no change since they don't import from China. In fact, much of the US set, uh, economies do not directly import anything. That's the industry level uh, ranking of sectors in terms of exposure, relative exposure to China trade. Now, the second stage is to convert that into commuting zone or region level measure. How does one do that? Well, any given region, uh, let's say metropolitan Washington DC, we know how labor force is allocated in different sectors. So we know the employment share of each industries. I guess DC must be government sector's largest, university second largest, something like that. <laughs> Maybe the real estate Mo Mongol now is the third largest, I don't know. But you know, you know the employment share. S since each industry, we know the exposure uh, to China trade. For any given region, you can do a weighted average of all of those industries with weights uh, being proportional to the employment share. So now you convert industry level exposure to China to location or commuting zone level exposure to China. And so some region will, expo will be more exposed to China shock, maybe Detroit, others will be less, maybe Washington DC, since Washington DC is even more service uh, oriented uh, than uh, uh, some manufacturing based cities. All right, so that's. That's how you do uh, direct exposure measure. Now, let, let me explain uh, how we measure downstream and upstream. Now, that's for also the two-stage process. At first, starting with the industry level. 
at the, at the industry level. Uh, um, so every industry uses inputs from uh, many industries, including yourself, including other industries. Right? So let's take automobile as an uh, example. Automobile uses glass, rubber, steel, electric components, and then accounting service, financial service, and so on. So I know a list of my upstream uh, sectors, and I know the importance of each of my upstream sector for me in terms of share of my cost. Since I, since I know how each of my upstream industry is exposed to imports from China, the downstream effect is simply a weighted average of all of my upstream sectors exposure to import from China with industry weights proportional to how, each of them, how important each of them is in my total cost. That's my downstream effect. You can construct upstream uh, effect similarly at the industry level. Now, the second stage is to go from industry level measure to region, measure, uh, region level measure, same thing. Since a given region, I know how workforce is allocated in each industries. And for each industry, I have a downstream calculation. Therefore, for a given region, a region level downstream effect is simply weighted average of all of the industry level downstream effect with the weights proportional to local employment share. Okay? You do the same thing for upstream uh, measure for region. So what does, what does this mean? This means for every industry or every commuting zone, there are three attributes, or trade affects local employment through three channels. My employment may be hurt by trade through direct competition effect. My employment could be helped by trade because my firms use imported inputs. My employment could also be hurt by trade because firms in my region supply stuff to other US firms that compete with China uh, directly. So, any given industry, any given region, simultaneously has three attributes. So in contrast to the previous study, when they assume every industry or location only has one channel affected by trade, now say there are three channels affected by trade, and our, our uh, <coughs> methodology allows, uh, allows us to quantify the importance of each of the three channels. So that's what we do. Okay. I'm going to skip those. I promise you I'm not going to show you equations. Um, so again, this is a gra uh, uh, graphical representation of the entire United, United States labor market now uh, divided into 722 uh, commuting zones. Now, um, so I, uh, now I'm going to show you, uh, you know, what does this each of the three channels uh, look like. So here I'm giving you a plot of the industry level because uh, 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 there are fewer number of industries than number of commuting zones. Here, this is a test of your eyesight, how good your eyesight is. So there are, there are actually three, uh, bars are in three colors. Uh, so so um, hold, on the horizontal axis are all of the sectors in the US industry, number from one to 56. It happens to be the order of, it, order of the sectors uh, in uh, input output uh, table. Uh, I didn't put the name on it, it's too messy to read. But roughly speaking, uh, lower numbers are agriculture and raw material and a bunch of manufacturing sectors and then service sectors, basically. The red color represents growth in imports from China, or direct exposure. Direct exposure essentially happens just in manufacturing sector to first order approximation. Virtually nothing in service sector. When I say virtually nothing because some service sector could, in, you know, you can, call sentence when you could import something, uh, but not very much. So, so direct competition essentially happens in manufacturing sectors only, and a relatively small number of manufacturing sectors, in particular textile, computer and electronics, electric equipment, and other manufacturings, have very big exposure to China competition, imports from China. So very small number uh, manufacturing collectively is already a small part of the U.S. economy, and other manufacturing sector, rel relatively small number of manufacturing sector, experience very sharp uh, increase in competition from uh, China. The, the yellow bar are measures of indirect exposure to trading with China through the downstream effect. 
um, and, and the one prominent feature about this, this is very widely spread uh, across virtually uh, every part of the economy for very intuitive reason. Again, you know, uh, China's uh, major exports are not just things that show up in Walmart, but also intermediate goods, laptops, computers, other electro electric equipment, uh, steel, and so on. Those things get to used in a broader set of economy, uh, 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 helping users to be more competitive and, and to hire more people. So it turns out to be, you know, there's a, a relatively big yellow bar in many, many, uh, many, many sectors. The green bars are the indirect exposure to China trade through the upstream channel. So they are also uh, uh, very widely spread, not as wide as, as, the, as the yellow bar, but more widely spread than direct effects. But they are small, numerically speaking, uh, it turns out. So I, I don't do the same graph for the commuting zones, but too many data points. Uh, but so let me let me now uh, so just give you an idea about uh, the relative importance of the three channels. Now let let me go to uh, analysis. I suppose to uh, Maggie, when I'm supposed to stop? Soon. Uh, Ten minutes. Okay, so see if I can do five minutes. So I give you give you a time to challenge me. So the so so here um, let's see. So uh, I'm going to show you just two regression tables. So one is, uh, um, uh, first, if one just do what Otto Don Hansen, Pierce, and Schott, and many other people in the literature do, which is to focus on changes in manufacturing jobs and link that to changes in local exposure to direct imports from China. If you just do that, you'll find a negative association between the two variables. Regions with the experience faster increase in imports from China tend to see a faster decline in manufacturing employment. So you confirm what other people are saying. We scale our uh, variable by working age cohort rather than labor force, but that doesn't really matter. So you still get a negative sign, and you, in fact, you get a bigger uh, point uh, uh, estimate. In other words, uh, we are not doing anything particularly tricky uh, uh, here, so we don't really throw out the results by, by stealth. So if you just focus, if you just do what they do, you get the result, in fact, with a slightly bigger point estimate. However, uh, if you also expand the analysis for your work to include uh, supply chain perspective, downstream effect and upstream effect, and also, instead of just looking at what happens to manufacturing employment, but also look at what happens to employment outside manufacturing sector, and do they link to trade uh, uh, in a systematic way or not? Uh, you will find a different pattern. So here's what uh, we have so-called two-stage regression. So I'm not going to explain that. But let me focus on the, 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 the central result. So once you expand the framework by taking into account the supply chain perspective, you're going to see downstream channel uh, tends to uh, produce a uh, uh, positive impact on employment in manufacturing sector and non-manufacturing sec non sector especially in non-manufacturing sectors. So non-manufacturing sectors, employment goes up systematically, goes up more in regions when uh, there's more uh, uh, downstream sector exposure, the indirect downstream sector exposure uh, to US-China trade. These are uh, just what's called elasticity estimates. To, to uh, interpret this uh, in an easier way, I'm going to combine information from those regression uh, with uh, information on average value of each of the variable uh, in a typical US labor market, uh, initial share, uh, and so on. So I'm going to uh, go to a table like this, which is easier to uh, interpret. This is, you know, what does the, you know, given the way US China trade has grown from 2000, in this particular table is 2000 to 2014, given the actual change in trade. If you zoom in a typical commuting zone, so typically, community zone is one in which all the relevant variables takes the average value of the US economy. You know, what, what does the trade change mean for local labor market through all of those channels? First, the direct effect is negative. Right? So direct competition leads to a decline in manufacturing job. This point, point, minus 0.1 percent means a decline in manufacturing job at the rate of 0.1 percent a year, every year on average during this period. 
pretty large effect. It turns out this is going to be offset by some other channels. Most importantly, expansion of jobs, especially in non-manufacturing sector uh, during this period, at the rate of 1.5% a year, every year, over this period. So that's how one uh, reached this. If you sum up all of the other channels, I skipped the, you know, there are upstream channels that so on, quantitatively not as large. If you sum up all those channels, changing employment through each of three channels, both in manufacturing sectors and non-manufacturing sectors, the total effect is summarized by this number. So if change in US-China trade is the only thing that happens during this period, the average uh, local labor market in the US would have experienced an increase in total employment at a rate of 1.3% a year, every year. Gary, yeah, um, uh, let me give you my mic. Thanks. No, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, so I, I'm just curious as to how certain service industries fit into the scheme here, such as education, tourism. It's a little difficult to think of these as having an explicit downstream linkage, but there may be. Uh, so how would those two industries fit into your non-manufacturing sector? So my previous graph, uh, you know, uh, depicting effect of each channel for each sector. So that graph, one of those will include tourism, one of them will include education. Education happens to be a very large uh, 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 sector for the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, what, what you'll see is I mean, so what is downstream channel for, for education. The fact that uh, we can use globally sourced inexpensive furniture, laptops, lights, uh, and so on. These are the ch concrete channels through which schools benefit from globalization in general and trading with China in, in particular. So that's the thing. Tourism, the same thing, I think affects maybe somewhat, uh, somewhat less to the extent we also use smartphones, laptops, electronics, and so on. Uh, to conduct tourism business. The competitiveness of those firms derive in part from opportunity to use those inputs. So that these are the channels. Of course, not all service sectors benefit equally, and our calculation takes that into account. So, so I suppose it could be we can think of Chinese students. We can think of Chinese students coming here as uh, cell phones in China, in which there's value added, right? And then the cell phones are being re-exported. Right. And so uh, Chinese students are coming here, and we're providing value added, and then exporting the, the students. So what about the compensation and job creation associated with you and me and other instructors in higher education, for example? Yeah, it's the same, same thing. I mean, we don't have fine enough detail to uh, break down employment by particular jobs. Mm -hmm. but, but generally, uh, schools, I imagine you know, middle schools, vocational schools included, turns out to employ as many people as they do today, partly because the inputs are so competitive. Right? So, lower, so being able to save money on furniture, laptop, mm -hmm. allows you or enables schools in general to hire more people. That's the, that's the idea, right? potentially including professors. So we may not. Next time we, we publish paper, we should, uh, should also thank Lenovo and Huawei and other Lenovo. <laughs> so you're assuming that Capital labor substitution in higher education. We can, so the, so capital goes down, so you're able to hire, hire more labor? That's implicit. So the calculation, of course, is you know, look at what actually happens mm -hmm. in employment by sector, by region. Mm -hmm. And the influence is derived by uh, exploring variation across regions. So that's implicit. We don't have to make particular assumption about elasticities, but these are whatever value, value is elasticity they will show up in the observed. Uh, uh, ver Values of the variables. Okay, so um, so that's that. I want to note uh, at this point, uh, you know, uh, I, I want to. I, mean, I had a in, you know, mental debate with my myself. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, is the is the downstream effect too large? You know, how plausible is it for it to be large enough to offset uh, the direct negative, the negative effect coming from direct competition? And I convinced myself uh, it is plausible. So let me. Uh, say uh, uh, two remarks on this. In number one, you know, again, it's important to keep in mind the downstream effect happens in broader set of economy uh, than direct competition. Direct competition is 
happens in relatively small part of US economy. Peace. I suppose I'm struggling with this. I mean, the good news is I'm not American and I'm not Chinese. So I, I can honestly say I have no vested interest in this at all. Um, if your thesis is correct, um, and I'm not an economist, so I'll come right out and say that, so I, I have no idea. But thinking of it from a political perspective then, if, you're, if, if your thesis is correct, which seems to be that as you lower the cost of manufacturing by putting it to low cost manufacturing economies, and you allow market access, then the implication would be that China should be opening its economy to import manufactured imports coming from low-cost economies in Asia and in Africa. But the evidence is they're not. So if it has a positive benefit, why would they not be doing that? And the answer, I think, is because of the political dimension. So the, uh, the f first part of the comment is, is it correct that uh, greater openness will help an economy? I think the answer is yes. Uh, 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 certainly not just this research, but other research by me and research by other people, I, I think that suggests that's the case. And not just in ca uh, that's the case in general, but also for China, maybe especially for China, A. B, as a factual statement, of course, changing openness for China during this period, period has been much greater than the change in the US. Ch China used to be a very isolated protectionist economy. When I was a, a child, you know, the, the right analogy one can think about China then is North Korea today. It's very isolated. So the, so the kind of a change we're talking about during this period, it's not that China is uh, very closed. Exactly the contrary, the change in openness, the expansion in openness is much greater for China than virtually any other economy in the world during this period, including the US. Uh, many objective measures will tell you this. For example, trade to GDP ratio, China was like North Korea in 1980. Today, trade to GDP ratio for China is about 50% higher than for the United States. Inward investment, China is, a, of course, a smaller economy than the uh, uh, US. China, for perhaps two decades or so, uh, is one of the world's largest uh, destination for foreign direct investment. In fact, between China and US, sometimes US number one, some China is now when it alternates be, uh, between the two, given that China is a smaller economy. So China is also very open to foreign direct investment. <clears throat> in spite of the many stories uh, you uh, one reads and talk about, this, in other words, it's not that China is as open as when it could. There's more room to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to improve, for sure. In terms of relative degree of openness, it has changed tremendously. In fact, uh, 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 the, now going back to how plausible uh, is uh, this idea uh, that, uh, that the net effect of trade does not produce net employment. In fact, the China example is important. If you look at change in both tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers, during this period, of course, China experienced much greater trade shock than the United States. Because China just, the very nature of WTO accession is a unilateral liberalization, right? to uh, first order approximation, China needs to liberalize to qualify for WTO membership. Other countries don't, to, don't, to do, don't, to do, uh, don't have to do anything else. Um, I say to a first order approximation because it's not exactly right. It turns out US, by uh, granting China permanent normal relationship, in other words, treating China the same way as US does to any other country, this simple act, in fact, implies some liberalization on the US side. So that's sort of the exception to that uh, uh, statement, but, but uh, changing trade policy and changing openness policy in general has, has been much greater for China during this period than for any other country, including the United States. And yet, no one talk about a spike in unemployment. So that uh, uh, is another uh, uh, potentially relevant observation that suggests that, that the economy can adjust to trade shock and employment is not as disastrous. Now, one might argue, that may be true for China, but China and US are different in so many different ways. That's not necess uh, uh, a completely a fair comparison. How about comparing US to other high income countries? Here I want to uh, take note of uh, a, a recent paper by Sharon uh, Treberman, a professor at the, uh, uh, New York University, whose paper is at the revised resubmit uh, stage with American Econ Economic Review. What he does is to look at impact of China trade shock, same trade shock we're talking about here, on Danish labor market. So Danish is a 
high-income uh, country, uh, 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 Denmark. Uh, what's, interesting about, uh, what's interesting about his paper is for you know, Denmark doesn't have the same kind of a privacy notion as the US, and government makes available information on individuals. And you can link individual workers to the employers. So what he does is to trace out what happened to individual workers uh, in, during a time when Danish and Europe's imports from China has increased a lot. What he found is, generally speaking, displaced workers, including displaced manufacturing sector workers, get reabsorbed into labor force sufficiently quickly so that on net, and, and uh, uh, trading with China also create uh, you know, uh, business opportunities. On net, the China trade shock appears to produce a small positive uh, effect on total employment. So total labor force participation rate appears to go up a little bit uh, after the shock. Uh, and, and that evidence uh, is consistent with what we will find. Now, uh, any international uh, comparison of labor market institutions uh, tends to suggest that the US has a more flexible labor market, meaning labor force, uh, labor market is, has an easier time to adjust, less regulatory and other barriers to adjust than Denmark or any other European countries. Danish economy happens to be somewhat more flexible than other European economies, but not as flexible as US economy by virtually any measure one can get data on. So that you will say uh, the Otto Don Hansen conclusion is more puzzling than what I'm describing uh, here, because if you just compare to other high income country that's supposed to have less flexible labor market, they seem to adjust well to the same trade shock. Uh, that I think is uh, not a potentially corroborative uh, evidence on, on this. Maybe, you, maybe we can just open up for discussion. I don't need to go on, I guess. Please, uh, microphone is coming to you. There. Um, I find myself convinced by your analysis, but I'm wondering if there's been any response by the people you are critiquing, either in print or informally, and if so, what do they say about your analysis? Yeah, so, so one, uh, one uh, uh, these are my friends, so we are all, <laughs> we debate uh, uh, fiercely, but then we're friends. They, uh, uh, you know, one thing they ask, uh, I cannot read, two minutes left, okay, thank you. Um, it is, uh, 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 can the downstream effect so large? You know, can you uh, provide some corroborative evidence uh, on this? This is exactly what I spent the last five minutes on, right? So, so, so I, I, I want to strengthen additional evidence that goes in that direction. The macro fact, by the way, also go in the same direction. I, I, you know, I started by pointing out the fact that US unemployment rate and US trade deficit generally go in the opposite direction. That fact is much easier to be uh, reconciled with what I'm saying here than what they, what they claim. Right? So it's also a, a relevant piece. That's one. And there are some comments about, uh, comments about some technical details. So, so one of the things, uh, these three authors, Otto Don Hansen, team up with two other uh, authors. Uh, uh, in one of their uh, uh, research articles, publications, are also trying to bring in supply chain perspective and conclude that adding supply chain perspective gives you nothing. In fact, you find no effect from downstream channel and you find even more negative effect from upstream channel. So I look at that paper, I say, well, you know, that's actually not quite correctly done. Uh, 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 let me give you uh, two examples, uh, two, two, two uh, areas where uh, we differ from them, I, I think, in a way that's uh, more consistent with, uh, 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 with the uh, basic idea. So, uh, number, uh, number one, um, you know, when we think of, when you con construct downstream effect, that the point of a downstream effect is that, you know, firms can indirectly benefit from trade by using imported intermediate goods. So, being able to use imported intermediate goods is the, is the cost of the downstream effect. In their attempt of computing downstream effect, they simply look at in imports in up upstream sector rather than just the intermediate, intermediate good part of the imports. So implicitly, one would have to assume that intermediate goods to final goods ratio is the same across all sectors for their methodology to be correct. That's, that that uh, assumption can be easily rejected uh, in the data. That's one. Two, uh, their calculation also implicitly assumes that you know, when you look at, in, uh, even, if, uh, even if they do intermediate goods, uh, correctly, uh, when it comes to allocating intermediate goods into 
different downstream sectors. They implicitly assume that intermediate goods coming from Germany are allocated across US sectors the same way as intermediate goods coming from China. The assumption comes the fact that they, they work with uh, what's called single country input output table. They, they use US input output table. The, in, a, in the US input output table, there's no distinction between imports from China, imports from Germany, imports from Canada. Just to make sure we do it right, we uh, use what's called inter-country input output tables so that we know, uh, so, so the you know, computers, electronic equipment coming from China gets allocated across US sectors differently from same type of imports coming from Germany based on, uh, based on data. So it turns out those, uh, uh, you know, attention to details uh, makes a, a imp uh, difference uh, in, the, in, the, in the results. Uh, actually, uh, unfortunately, we will need to, to stop there. We hope that everyone will stick around and Can uh, I have the opportunity. conclude with one uh, comment on political yes, economy? Yes, absolutely. Let me say one thing. So, so I don't need to uh, give you additional uh, analysis, analytical results, but here's uh, one uh, implication on, on the political economy discussion, right? So some people will say uh, um, two, two things. Like one is, uh, you know, after Brexit, after, uh, after uh, uh, Trump victory, many people will say, uh, all those things clearly shows that globalization produces winners and losers. We need to pay more attention to losers. We need to make, pay more attention to redistributions. They might be right. I want to say those comments are also incomplete. Important nuances need to be taken into account when we think about public policies. One, from, from this analysis, what it says is it's quite possible if people only realize the direct effects of globalization, not realizing the indirect effects. So people who, so, so that many people who lose their job and then get reabsorbed, reabsorbed into labor force, you know, uh, you know uh, a year later. They attribute loss of a job to globalization. They didn't realize that in fact, reabsorption to the job, many of them reabsorbed into higher paying jobs, in fact, also due to globalization. And we know, like I said earlier, workforce as a whole experienced an improvement in real wage. Uh, 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 after, after, globalization, after trading with uh, China, because we didn't realize this. So, so people may very well vote in a way that's against their economic interest without realizing that. The importance for public policy is, yes, we want to see, can we do better on redistribution, but that's not enough. Another important implication for policy is that more uh, support for good re research needs to be provided so we understand the true comprehensive effects. Number one, number two, we need to do a better job in educating ourselves and educating uh, you know, general uh, voting public in general about what is the true effect of globalization. I think then we'll come up uh, uh, to, be, uh, to, to have a more uh, correct, more comprehensive view about the effect of globalization. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Hong Jin.